to play, to work, to visit, to breathe. Now is not the time to give up. We are stronger than this virus. When it's your turn, roll up your sleeve and stick it to COVID. What I miss is uh, being out there, coming through the gate and getting ready to play. I miss uh, the noise that Ryder fans bring. If I was talking to Ryder fans, I would say, get your shot, be ready, because we're going to have a football season, and we need you in the stadium. If you ever had to look a child in the eye that's relying on you to protect them, would you say, yes, I will protect you? And that's essentially it. I will get the vaccine, I will protect you because you can't protect yourself. Because I will do anything at all costs to protect my daughter. Getting the COVID-19 vaccine for me will be a huge priority. I want to do everything that I can to keep my staff healthy. It's really just the only option to resume normal life. Walking through to the chair where the vaccine was felt like a hero walk. And I feel that everyone who is going to receive the vaccine is going to get that feeling, you know, that split second jab. Best one. Pardon me. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. From the Legislative Building here in Regina, we have Premier Scott Moe. And joining us virtually is Saskatchewan's Chief Medical Health Officer, Dr. Sakib Shahab, and the CEO of the Saskatchewan Health Authority, Scott Livingstone. We will have opening remarks followed by time for questions. Thank you very much uh, and good afternoon everyone and thank you for joining us uh, today. Over the, the past couple of weeks, the Saskatchewan Health Authority uh, as well as pharmacies across Saskatchewan have been vaccinating or offering vaccinations at, a, at an incredible pace. In, in the past week alone, over 131,000 Saskatchewan people have received their, their COVID shot. That's about 13% of all eligible residents uh, that have received a vaccination just in a single week. Over 40% of, of, of eligible residents are now fully vaccinated in our province. In fact, Saskatchewan is the first province in Canada to reach 40% fully vaccinated. And if we maintain this pace, about 60% uh, could be fully vaccinated by the time all restrictions are lifted on July the 11th. And over 70% would be fully vaccinated by the end of July. So this is not a one-dose summer in any way. It is a two-dose summer. It is a great summer uh, for the vast majority of Saskatchewan residents. The vaccines are truly working as well, which is great news. As vaccinations continue to rise, COVID transmissions continue to decline. Our seven-day average of new cases is now at 46. That is down 84% from the third wave peak of 287 that we had seen in mid-April. That is a direct result of so many people doing their part. Yes, following the measures, but also going out and getting vaccinated. We now have more than enough vaccines for everyone and clinics are open in every corner of the province. So there is really no reason for you to not be vaccinated other than your own personal choice. If you are making that choice, I would say that you are making a mistake. Next week, we will release our updated numbers for the month of June, breaking down the number of new COVID cases by unvaccinated people, partially vaccinated people, as well as fully vaccinated people. And I'm sure it will show, as it did in May, that the overwhelming majority of people who are now contracting COVID and are becoming seriously ill are ultimately unvaccinated people. The Public Health Agency of Canada recently released uh, some figures showing that since vaccines have been widely available, over 95% of new cases in Canada have been in unvaccinated people. About 4% 
of, of those cases were from partially vaccinated people, and about half of 1% were from fully vaccinated people. So vaccines are working. Vaccines are significantly lowering the risk for Saskatchewan residents and for all Canadians, except in those of us that may choose to not be vaccinated. For you, you are still at risk, and there is no reason for you to be at that risk. So please, consider going out and getting vaccinated. Because of our increasing number of vaccinations, decreasing case numbers, we are feeling quite, quite well about where we are at with our reopening roadmap in Saskatchewan, feeling very well about moving to step three and the complete removal of all public health orders by July the 11th. At that point, there will be no restrictions on gathering sizes, no requirements to, to wear a mask, although you may want to continue to wear a mask in certain situations, in particular if you are not fully vaccinated. That will be totally up to you. It will also be up to businesses and other employers to decide whether they want to keep any of their COVID practices that they currently have uh, in place past July the 11th, such as physical distancing, uh, access to hand sanitizers, mask use for their employees and potentially even customers. The business response team is working actively with Dr. Shahab and his team and they have developed and released uh, some guidelines for individuals, for businesses as well as for employers to consider. Once all of the mandatory rules and restrictions are removed on July the 11th, those guidelines uh, will then be released and posted on the government website over the course of the next few days. There's also been some question about whether certain venues and events can ask for proof of vaccination before allowing people to attend those events. And that will not be a provincial requirement in Saskatchewan. Of course, our government is strongly encouraging every eligible person to take the time to go out and get vaccinated, but it would be a potential violation of health information privacy if we were to do this, if we were to ask for anyone, anyone for the proof of vaccination in order to attend an event. That said, as always, we want everyone to go out and get vaccinated. We have the vaccines available in our clinics and pharmacies across this province. Vaccines are proving to be very, very effective at protecting Saskatchewan people, thereby driving down our case numbers, driving down our hospitalizations, and ultimately saving lives each and every day in this province and across this nation. So let's all get vaccinated so that we are all ready for things to get back to normal in our province uh, here in under two weeks when all the restrictions will then be lifted uh, on July the 11th. On another note, I hope that everyone uh, does have a great Canada Day in Saskatchewan. I hope they also take a moment to reflect on the history of our province and our country. Both the, th the, the things that we can all be proud of, as well as to take a moment to reflect on the things that uh, we should not be uh, so proud of. This is a great country for the most part because as individuals and as organizations, as governments, we do respect and value all people regardless of their race, religion, their gender or their sexual orientation. And when you look back historically, the worst moments in our Canadian history is when we have forgotten to do that. When we have violated that ideal of equality and respect for everyone. We can all learn, and I would put forward that we must all learn, from, from that to make our nation and our province an even better place in the days ahead. Dr. Shahab. Thank you, Premier. Um, so I'll begin by expressing my condolences to the families and friends of the three Saskatchewan residents who have passed away as a result of COVID-19 since our last briefing uh, last Thursday afternoon. Uh, we continue to see sporadic cases particularly in those par parts of the province where vaccination rates are still lower than where we would like to be. So that's mostly uh, the Prince Albert area, the northwest part of the province, the far north. Uh, vaccination rates are in increasing throughout uh, the, 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 the province and even in the far north and north. There are many communities with, with very high vaccination rates, uh, but the Saskatchewan Health Authority and Indigenous Service Partners are continuing to bring vaccines closer to communities that may not have been able to take advantage of all the opportunities so far. And even when uh, they, there, where, when vaccines are brought, uh, we are seeing a, a significant increase in uptake, even in pockets uh, which are under vaccinated. So again, I think that momentum uh, um, uh, needs to continue to make the entire province um, uh, safe uh, for opening, reopening in step three. Um, and as we move forward, you know, obviously, 
uh, once we have reopened step three, public health will continue to monitor and respond to COVID-19 cases and outbreaks, just like we do with any other endemic vaccine preventable illness. Um, because we know that uh, while um, the pandemic continues in many parts of the world, primarily due to lack of access to vaccine, uh, we uh, uh, COVID will, for the foreseeable future, be an endemic um, illness in Canada with occasional outbreaks and clusters, which public health will have to respond to. Um, and in, the, in that sense, you know, public health will maintain uh, its core programming to monitor and respond to localized outbreaks, uh, which are likely to happen more when they are gatherings or pockets of uh, individuals who are primarily unvaccinated. Uh, testing will continue, as well as content investigations based on positive test results uh, following the procedures that are now in place, which includes that if you're unvaccinated and a close contact of a confirmed case, you will be required to self-isolate for at least two weeks. Um, and testing will continue to play a vital role in uh, early identification of outbreaks. Uh, you know, we have had a few instances where individuals were unwell, this did seek testing, which is great, but then did go on to attend a social event in which case, which resulted in settings where there were other unvaccinated people in outbreaks. So again, a reminder that, you know, it's important to complete our vaccination schedules and at any time, irrespective of your vaccine status, if you are unwell, stay home and get tested. Um, we will also obviously continue to issue public service announcements uh, in settings where communities or events where the risk of transmission remains high or we cannot connect with all potential contacts. And this is not new. We do that all the time for other vaccine preventable diseases like measles, mumps, whooping cough, and we'll continue to do that with COVID. And again, we have to remember that many common respiratory illnesses really uh, went away over the last eight, 16 months because of all the precautions that were especially around COVID. So obviously, uh, you know, unfortunately we uh, may see a resurgence of other respiratory illnesses as well in the fall and, and COVID will, could be one of them, but hopefully it will not be a pandemic. It'll be sporadic cases and clusters, just like with other respiratory illnesses and other vaccine preventable diseases. Um, and again, you know, the higher our vaccine uh, rate continues to go first dose and second dose over the summer, the better we'll be placed in the fall. COVID-19 case and, uh, you know, information on uh, rates will continue to be posted on Saskatchewan.ca and provincial medical health officers will continue to monitor trends. If we do observe a substantive increase, you know, under the Public Health Act, you know, ne necessary local measures can be taken just like with other outbreaks. Um, uh, but again, the higher our vaccine uptake, the less likely those events become. And again, one vaccine provides good protection, but two doses are required for optimal protection and you're fully protected two weeks after your second dose. Um, you know, survey after service shows that, you know, while 10% of the population may be quite hesitant for the remaining 20% who haven't yet received the first dose, you know, really it, it, it seems to be more of a question of convenience and complacency, not so much of hesitancy because whenever the SHA and partners have done pop-up clinics, brought vaccines closer to where people work and live, uptake has been high. But again, I, you know, I really encourage all residents who still have not taken their first dose to keep an eye out of what's happening in their uh, local area. And even if they're out and about in another part of the province, take advantage of any clinic that's accessible to them. You know, anyone who's a resident of Saskatchewan can get vaccinated anywhere in Saskatchewan. Um, we're coming to the point where, you know, while mass uh, vaccination clinics may continue or reduce in frequency, you know, there, there will always be vaccine available throughout the summer and into the fall. Um, and in addition to pharmacies, you know, the Saskatchewan Health Authority will be continuing uh, with, you know, uh, initiatives to reach as many uh, people as possible. Uh, so, you know, all these things um, will make it possible for us to, you know, enjoy the summer, go to events, travel in a safe um, uh, way, uh, especially uh, by being fully vaccinated and, and help us to be better prepared for the fall as well. Thank you. Thank you, Premier Mo and Dr. Shahab. We will now take questions and we'll start in the room. Arthur. Sure. Um, so uh, you said that there are privacy concerns with the prospect of a requiring proof of vaccination for large scale, say, you know, stadium type events. Um, I'm just kind of wondering on 
what basis you came to that conclusion. Did you seek a legal opinion of some kind? Because it does seem like this is something that's being done elsewhere, particularly Winnipeg. It seems like they're going through a similar uh, sort of system. And particularly because it seems as though a large, kind of a uh, fairly large majority of the province's population here does want to see something of this sort according to a, a UMS survey that just came out. All right, uh, Scott, I might ask you uh, to uh, maybe uh, make a comment on, with respect uh, to a specific HIPAA privacy laws and uh, things of that nature. First, with respect to polls, I'd say we, um, you know, there's polls that are occurring all of the time. We, we don't govern by polls. Uh, we govern by, uh, you know, proper policy as well as um, what we can and can't do with respect to uh, privacy, uh, privacy information. I believe there's a story this morning from the Privacy Commissioner on, on uh, uh, you know, requirements around producing, um, you know, information on whether or not you, you're vaccinated. The same would hold true for uh, large large public events as, as well. When we get uh, past July 11th, uh, we're going to be into an area where the emergency order will not be in place and we, uh, uh, you know, most certainly um, don't have the ability then to um, demand that people would uh, show a proof of vaccination for uh, whether or not they would attend a, you know, any large event uh, here uh, in, in the province. Um, so that that being said, uh, there is an area where there may be some requirements to show a, a vaccination. They won't be in the provincial uh, scope or sphere of influence, but in the federal, the, the national or maybe the international sphere of influence uh, in much the same way that uh, when you travel internationally now to many parts of the world, you do need to provide a proof of vaccination for malaria for you know typhoid some of these other uh, uh, vaccinations that are available it's entirely possible that you're going to uh, require to have a, a, a proof of covid vaccination in, in many much the same way that you do now to achieve a, or to attain a, a visa to visit uh, some of these countries and so internationally uh, there will be um, quite likely some parallel requirements uh, to enter other countries and maybe uh, even some 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 requirements to provide a proof of vaccination to uh, not have to participate in a two-week self-isolation period on your return to Canada in, in the nation as well. And so we're working uh, with the federal government on how um, that information could be provided quite likely through the individual uh, if they should choose to provide it or not. Um, but uh, with respect to uh, provincial uh, vaccine passports or uh, requirements to be vaccinated to attend uh, certain events or to work in certain areas or, or anything of that nature. Uh, the, the government of Saskatchewan is not moving that direction. Uh, Scott, do you want to uh, uh, comment at all on uh, uh, HIPAA laws themselves or uh, the uh, legality of uh, you know requiring, I, I guess, a, a vaccine proof of vaccination to attend an event and and uh, you know how that might be how that uh, could 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 or could not be impacted, I guess. Sure, thank you, Premier. So of course, Arthur could always follow up with the Privacy Commissioner. We'd probably be in the best position to uh, give him, uh, quote unquote, the HIPAA regulations, but I can confirm, you know, post the uh, removal of public health orders and the state of emergency on July 11th, we'll go back to our normal processes of uh, accessing information for residents, remind folks that even your health card number is personal health information. Banks are not allowed to ask for you know your health card number, and and nobody else is uh, for a form of ID. It is personal information, and so is vaccination status. So the premier is right uh, that that it is within the HIPAA regulations. That is personal health information, and it's not a requirement for an individual to to one provide it or other individuals to even ask for it if it's not related to the provision of health services. Uh, on on this, and uh, Dr. Shahab has been saying this uh, for quite some time now that once you're eligible you're always eligible for your first dose and ultimately uh, 28 days later your your second dose and I, I think this is uh, an opportunity for us to just again reiterate and reinforce the importance of everyone uh, to go out and to make the choice uh, to get vaccinated um, we continue to climb uh, past the the benchmarks that we had set out 40 plus I believe is about 80 percent vaccinated now 30 plus about 75 percent vaccinated but I think this is a an opportunity for Saskatchewan 
people to really an unprecedented fashion as we find our way through the summer to, um, you know, please make that choice to go out and get vaccinated. Uh, we have always said, uh, get vaccinated to protect not only yourself, but those around you. As we get back uh, to a more normal uh, interactions in society, larger events, you know, I would really urge now uh, everyone to give some thought to the fact that uh, now you need to get vaccinated to protect yourself. Um, we are going to learn to live with COVID. We aren't going to get through or cure COVID in any way. We're going to learn to live with it. And if you choose to not be vaccinated, and I read the stats out earlier, uh, you are choosing to live uh, with much higher risk of not only getting COVID, but ultimately uh, getting, getting quite ill from COVID uh, than if you make a very different choice, which is to uh, make yourself available to the vaccines that are, are available to Saskatchewan people. Half a percent of the active COVID cases, the new cases in <coughs> in Canada, are from people that are fully vaccinated. Uh, that is, if if that isn't uh, proof enough that vaccines are proving to be very very effective, um, I, I don't know what what proof would convince you. Follow up, Arthur. Yeah, one follow up. Uh, you talked a bit about Canada Day, and there have been a <coughs> few decisions in a few northern communities to kind of perhaps cancel, perhaps postpone Canada Day uh, because of the recent findings uh, that we've seen at Calus's other places. Um, kind of, first of all, wondering what you think of those decisions, and further, whether you think people should perhaps celebrate Canada Day in a slightly different way this year, given the findings, yeah. and what you yourself will be doing in that yeah. Yeah, no, uh, you know what, uh, I, I know there's a number of uh, communities that have uh, chosen to not celebrate uh, Canada Day or to delay uh, that celebration until a later uh, a later date. And I, I think that's entirely appropriate and, and the decisions uh, that are being made at the uh, at the at the community level on whether or not to have uh, a coming together or to, to forego that for a period of time. I, I respect uh, both of those decisions uh, that are being made uh, across across this province. I, I will be, um, you know, celebrating Canada Day, um, recognizing uh, Canada on Canada Day and um, in, a, in a much lower key uh, event. I will be, uh, you know, I think in addition to celebrating what I believe is a great nation um, and a great nation with the great opportunity that lies before us. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, on this Canada Day in particular, I think I will also be reflecting uh, much more than I have on other Canada Days as to, to our history. Uh, both our positive history uh, in this nation, but also our history that is uh, not so positive and, and quite negative. And I had made some comments in my opening comments with respect to uh, um, how we need to continue to uh, respect uh, one another um, regardless of, of who we are and to treat people with exactly the same uh, degree of respect that we uh, would hope to be treated to with uh, in, in, in return. So I, I will be having much additional reflection uh, this year on, on, Canada's, on Canada's past. But I also think, and I, I, I'll be reflecting on the words of, of Chief DeLorme, uh, where he'd said, you know, this, what has occurred with respect to uh, uh, residential schools and and the, um, you know, the identification of a number of unmarked graves, and we expect there will likely be more in the in the weeks ahead in this province and in this nation. Um, that this is part of the the reconciliation path, the reconciliation road that we need to travel, and we need to travel it together, all of us, Indigenous as well as non-Indigenous uh, people. This was identified uh, uh, in the verbal accounts at the Truth and Reconciliation uh, uh, Commission, identified in the report as that part of the uh, the reconciliation process is to actually uh, identify uh, where these unmarked graves are and and identify uh, ultimately uh, the individuals uh, that lie within and to help uh, provide the first steps of closure for those families and friends of, of these in individuals. And so this is part of the of the process of, of reconciliation. And uh, Chief DeLorme had spoken uh, about how this was a previous generation uh, that had made decisions uh, with respect to this. This was none of us uh, of this generation as individuals. Um, but what we do have the opportunity uh, as, as people of, of today, people of, of today's generation is to uh, determine how we act um, and how we move forward and move forward together as an inclusive society, as a respectful uh, society. And, and I think uh, that lies, yes, on, on governments and, and this 
government has uh, and continues to take steps to uh, ensure that we are uh, being respectful, we are recognizing our past, but trying to uh, make uh, as positive decisions as we can uh, to provide closure uh, for these families, but also to make positive decisions so that everyone is included in uh, you know, our economic society, in our, in our communities, and included in our, our province ultimately. We also have a, a, a responsibility as community organizations, but I think most importantly as individuals, uh, to ensure that we are, uh, you know, open and respectful in what we do each and every day. And, um, you know, I, educating ourselves, yes, on uh, what Canada's shared history is uh, with our Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people and understanding that uh, we need to do better as we uh, move forward. Uh, you know, there's a, I, I would just reference uh, what I think is a, a very positive initiative. There's a number of people that are um, placing backpacks on the, the steps of the legislature. 751 backpacks, I believe, will be on the steps of the legislature. Um, it provides an opportunity for all of us to, and to raise awareness and to take the initiative to educate ourselves on uh, what, the edu what, what the residential school system was and what it uh, ultimately did to a, a, a sector, uh, the Indigenous people in our, in our society. Um, but in those backpacks are school supplies that I understand will then be distributed uh, to people. Uh, to kids uh, for them to utilize as they attend school uh, the summer and into, into the fall. And I, I think that's also very indicative of, of uh, you know, taking some positive steps uh, into the future with uh, these, these backpacks are there for us to recognize our past, but also uh, filled with school supplies to, uh, you know, to, to help those as we, as we move forward uh, into the future. And there's no better place uh, for that uh, display of, of, of both uh, of both initiatives uh, than on the, the steps of our, our provincial capital building here, the, the legislature in Regina. And so I just take a moment to thank uh, all of those that have been involved in uh, in that initiative and all of that it represents. And I, I think in, in that initiative is a, is a uh, you know, a lesson uh, for all of us to take and to reflect and to think about on, you know, as we approach Canada Day this year. Celebrate however uh, you feel you, is appropriate uh, for you. Um, but certainly takes some time to reflect on, you know, our shared history and where we're going as individuals and as uh, communities uh, as, and as a society and as a province. We'll take our next question on the line, operator. We have Carla Shinkarek with CTV. Hi. Uh, first part of my question, um, just in light of the current outbreak at Oliver Lodge Care Home in Saskatoon, just wondering if um, the SHA mandates how lockdowns are carried out at the different homes or if it's left up to the homes, like, you know, can they leave their individual rooms? Do they have to be confined to their floor? And can they go outside? Scott, or uh, comment, and maybe Dr. Shahab as well. <clears throat> so the management of outbreaks across the province hasn't changed, and those, whatever restrictions are put in place would be guided by medical health officers locally. And as you know, that, that, that has resulted in different levels of uh, restrictions for homes, depending upon the extent of the outbreak and the uh, guidance from medical health officers. Dr. Shaw, anything to add? Yeah, the only comment I'll make is that obviously, you know, last 15 months were very significant in, in terms of significant restrictions, even in the absence of an outbreak, in terms of visiting long-term care homes. And then gradually those restrictions have been, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, reduced significantly, especially because of the impact of two doses of vaccines in long-term care residents where, you know, we have not seen the outbreaks that we saw earlier or other parts of Canada saw. Uh, but having said that, you know, uh, as we go into the future with, uh, you know, living with COVID, COVID will be managed just, just like any other respiratory illnesses. You know, fortunately last year we saw virtually no influenza outbreaks but we know that every year we get numerous influenza outbreaks in long-term care, uh, even though many residents are vaccinated. And then the response is very much a more localized, more um, uh, uh, you know, long-term care or facility-specific response where there's a, a, a single case, you know, the, uh, 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 the resident may be isolated till they're better. If there's two or more cases, it may only impact a wing of the long-term care facility and some restrictions may be placed uh, for a, a shortest period of time in that wing. But it'll be very similar to in the past how, uh, you know, uh, public health has worked with infection control to manage other respiratory outbreaks like influenza or norovirus. Again, you know, last year has been very unusual because we haven't seen a lot of these 
um, other communicable diseases go around, which, you know, uh, and, and that again reminds us if we are unwell with any respiratory symptoms, GI symptoms, stay home till you're better. Don't go and visit someone in hospital, long term care, school, or don't go to work if you're unwell. And I think those principles will serve us well, both for COVID and other respiratory or communicable diseases. Thank you. Follow up, Carla. And second part to the question is uh, Will the lockdown? guidelines, I guess, for a situation like that outbreak um, for seniors' homes change as the province hits step three. Scott? So without using the term lockdown, because I, I think Dr. Shahab has already addressed this, as we move into the endemic and learn to live with COVID, uh, just like we have with influenza and other respiratory illnesses, um, outbreak management will be the same for COVID. It might might have different degrees of uh, restrictions or um, infection control practices, depending upon the scope of the outbreak. But as you know, in, in, in long-term care, it is a very low bar that determines whether there's an outbreak and it's closely monitored because the risk these seniors uh, or our elderly and uh, you know people in long-term care have. However, to, again, to Dr. Shaw's point, we know with COVID with our hot, very high uh, double vaccination rates in our long-term care residents, uh, we have uh, put protections in place. So I don't suspect that we're going to see any changes to our outbreak management. However, COVID is a new virus. We've learned lots from COVID over the last 15 months, and we continue uh, to learn from it. And we'll take the guidance of our medical health officers, uh, together with Dr. Shahab, to, to guide what we do on a go-forward go basis. But as uh, I think Dr. Shahab very clearly outlined, is um, we will manage these outbreaks like we have managed outbreaks across other respiratory illnesses and we move into this next phase of our response to pandemic. We'll take our next question on the line. Operator? We have Adam Hunter with CBC. Hi. What is the uh, plan uh, to get more people first doses? I know uh, you guys mentioned that pop-ups have shown people are coming out. I know of a couple that have been pretty successful uh, right now. You know, we're trailing other provinces with Alberta as far as first doses go. Is there any concern that we're not going to have enough people first dosed and that's not going to protect the province? And what's being done to just get more, get those numbers higher? Scott, I'll maybe just make a comment and then uh, I'll uh, uh, leave it to you to uh, speak to the specifics of, you know, the, the initiatives uh, that we, the Saskatchewan Health Authority are undertaking to uh, continue to make uh, vaccines available for all people, first dose and second dose. As we know, uh, second dose is uh, uh, crucially important as well, uh, in particular as we're ensuring that we are, are, are vaccinating uh, for all of the variants of concern that are uh, present in Saskatchewan and, and across Canada. But I, I would just say uh, with respect to uh, the uptake of vaccines uh, here in the province, uh, Saskatchewan people have done uh, very, very well. I mean, we're, we're, we're like 699 three or four percent of uh, everyone uh, that is eligible uh, to receive a vaccine has received a vaccine. Um, that's that's on our covered population data. So that's on the data of, of the population that has a health card, a Saskatchewan health card. And the, you know, that is how we determine the one million and thirty three thousand uh, people that are that are over the age of 12. Uh, that covered population data in Saskatchewan is uh, equivalent to about 1,225,000 people uh, in the province that have a Saskatchewan health card. No, pardon me, not necessarily in the province, but that do have a Saskatchewan uh, health card. We, we know there's not 1.2, 1,225,000 people in Saskatchewan. Stats Canada data in this province is about 1,180,000 people, and some other provinces are using that Stats Canada data. We chose to use the covered population data from the beginning. But uh, if we were to use the Stats Canada data, like some other provinces uh, are, we'd actually be three and a half to four percent higher with our uh, with our vaccination rates. Now, um, that's neither here nor there. Uh, Saskatchewan people have uh, come out in in large large numbers. Um, first shot, we're at 722,000 people have uh, received the first shot. But yes, we want to continue to encourage um, those those few hundred thousand people that have not yet received their first shot to. I mean, please uh, make an appointment, find uh, your first opportunity to go out and get your first shot, and then uh, well, ultimately, when it's your turn, get your second shot. Uh, you're living with an unnecessary level of risk uh, when you understand that of the new COVID cases in our nation, half a percent of them are in fully vaccinated people, and we'd like you to join uh, that fully vaccinated group sooner 
rather than later. Uh, Scott, do you want to uh, make some comments specific to uh, the efforts that we're making? I think more so to make vaccines available to as many people. But yes, uh, first doses. Um, and and you know, I would I would just close with this. Um, you know, throughout this pandemic, uh, we've never ever for a second uh, wavered in our faith of Saskatchewan people in in, in doing the right thing. Um, we're seeing that continue through this vaccination program, and for that, I know all of us on the on the call here today are forever grateful. Uh, and we would just ask uh, even more Saskatchewan people to uh, make that decision to go out and get their get their vaccination. Scott. Thanks, Premier. And <clears throat> Adam, as we've talked about before, you know, we continue to offer a number of options and clinics uh, to uh, stimulate first doses, but also to, to keep doing our uh, maintaining momentum on second doses. Some of those things you've seen are pop-up clinics and, and newcomer clinics. We will continue to do so uh, regardless of uh, where we hit on July 11th. And, you know, even over the last week or so where we've seen much smaller numbers of first doses and second doses. Our second doses are skyrocketing up and we're gonna see some great numbers over the summer. But with the first doses, even at 12 to 15,000 a week, if you calculate that out over you know, the next two months <clears throat> until the end of August, that's another 100,000 Saskatchewan residents receiving first doses. We'd like to see that uptake faster. That's why we're trying to bring clinics out to as many sites possible to make it as convenient as possible for people to get their vaccinations, whether it's clinic at the lake, uh, you know, over the summer, you're going to see a lot of, I just looked at the list of clinics. As you know, we opened up over 41,000 uh, scheduled appointments today. I was looking through the list of how many clinics are available in lake communities, Loon Lake, Chittick, Christopher Lake. We're, we're trying to bring that as out to the community as much as possible. And I know that in Saskatoon, for example, this weekend, there's a large newcomer clinic scheduled with Dr. Tuck. Uh, Takaya, and uh, we're hoping to see those numbers go up across the province. But as I said, it's been slow, uh, slower than we like, uh, but we are seeing those numbers gradually increase, like we have throughout uh, the opening of uh, the opening plan, where each stage we see those numbers continue to climb, even though we haven't uh, or we've already met our targets, and we hope to see that throughout the summer. Important for folks to recognize, and the premier's already mentioned it as Dr. Shahab. Once you're qualified, you're always qualified for a vaccine. We'd like you to come in as soon as possible. You know, we are concerned, frankly, uh, both on first and second doses with the Delta variant out there. It's even more critically important for folks not just to get their first doses, but their second doses. And we are prepared, as Dr. Schraub has said, over the next weeks to come to continue to offer vaccines in as many convenient locations as we can. Follow up, Adam. You mentioned earlier that uh, the emergency health order would be uh, removed or rescinded on the 11th. What does that mean in practice as far as uh, what the government can do for public health measures and how that works for people that work for the government in healthcare? Um, I'll let Scott uh, comment specific to uh, uh, health care. Uh, what it means is that we no longer will need the, the emergency measures. Uh, in place because we were going to be lifting the public health measures uh, ultimately that are in place. Now uh, we are working on uh, you know just some some general guidance uh, for businesses for communities uh, on you know what you uh, you know may wish to keep in place such as physical distancing uh, access to uh, hand hand sanitizer ensuring that you have uh, proper sanitary standards in your uh, in your your place of business or your your community your community gathering place. Uh, as well as uh, Dr. Shahab had mentioned earlier, uh, you know, you know uh, just good old fashioned con common sense uh, needs to continue as well. If you're not feeling well, uh, you should stay home until uh, at such time that you, you are feeling better and uh, you might want to go get tested as well if your symptoms are, are, are thought to be something uh, near uh, to COVID. So the, the, the emergency order will be lifted as it will no longer be required as we will be lifting all of the public health uh, measures uh, that are in place. Uh, Scott, do you want to speak specifically to uh, the Saskatchewan Health Authority? So Adam, as, as I think you know, we, and we've talked about this um, throughout the pandemic, with the removal of the emergency order, it triggers uh, also the end of the memorandum of understanding. We were very lucky to negotiate with the union uh, uh, health care unions across this province. We were one of the few provinces that did not have to legislate a solution, and we're happy that we did negotiate um, that flexibility with the memorandum of understanding to be able to move staff around through the pandemic in areas of the lowest need. That, uh, that document will expire 28 days after the removal of the emergency health order. So you're gonna see some fundamental changes to staffing with respect to, you know, you won't see cohorting and long-term care. 
you'll see staff moving back to their quote unquote regular positions. And you'll also see at the same time, um, SHA working with Ministry of Health uh, to look at what types of services will be maintained uh, from a new service perspective, ongoing COVID response, not just immunization, contact tracing and uh, testing and, and whatnot, but also staff moving back into their positions and seeing more services in the health sector start resuming uh, across the board over the months of July, August, and, and certainly into the fall across the board, you know, the delays um, uh, in services or some of the reductions in services caused by outbreaks in long-term care, acute care facilities. We will be uh, working hard to catch up as we work on our, our service resumption plan. We'll take another question on the line, operator. We have Lara Fomanoff with 650 CKOM. Hi there, thank you so much for taking uh, my questions. Um, Testing numbers and positivity rates are much lower lately, and uh, the Saskatoon drive-through uh, is lately seeing a lot fewer vehicles than it once did. How long uh, will the drive-through sites remain open, and will they be scaled back at any point? Well, I think it's fair to say that at some point in time they will be uh, scaled back. If you look at the the last week, I think we've delivered. I think I mentioned in my opening comments about 130,000, or in excess of 130,000. Uh, vaccines uh, over the course of the past week. If you look at the first 100,000 uh, doses that we delivered in this province, that was over the course of about three months. Um, so you, we definitely are at the peak of our vaccination capability, utilizing, as you mentioned, drive-through capacity, utilizing our SHA appointment-based system, utilizing our uh, pop-up uh, clinics at various places in various communities, utilizing uh, the capacity of our, our pharmacies across this province and the access um, that all of those have into uh, so many communities uh, across across Saskatchewan, which is allowing us to achieve those 20,000 plus uh, vaccination numbers, um, you know, in multiple days uh, during over the over the course of a of a week. Um, so, with respect to um, when we might might start altering um, whether we have access to mass vaccination clinics, um, drive-throughs uh, as part of that, yes, will be uh, contingent on. You know, as we transition back to providing uh, as much of the the regular healthcare services as we can, and and start shifting away from some of the the focus on vaccinations and testing and and, and initiatives that we have uh, with respect to COVID, of which those services will still have to be available, most certainly, uh, but maybe not at the level that we have been they have been required over the course of of the past year. Um, so I, I don't know, Scott, if you have uh, actual dates on when you're going to be transitioning. Uh, back with uh, some of the larger mass vaccination clinics we have, but I suspect uh, that will be as we start to approach uh, the, um, you know, a, a the peak of our second doses uh, being made available, and and then continuing to start uh, to at a much lesser uh, level of, of doses each and every day, in continuing to increase our our first doses uh, and and ultimately following those up with second doses with a relatively uh, smaller population than than what we've uh, have been able to vaccinate over the course of the past few months. <clears throat> so just quickly to add, I mean, no, there is no defined time period or date that we've selected to reduce hours or cut back on the drive throughs Of course, you know, the current drive through schedules have been set more by vaccine supply than they have anything else as well as the uptake on book deployments, both in pharmacies and at the SHA. You know, as the Premier has mentioned, we, we have, you know, conservatively 25 to 30,000 dose a day capacity between the SHA pharmacy, our partners at ISC and NETA. And as we move into this phase and, and clean up on the second doses, we're seeing lower uptake. So certainly over time, um, potentially closer to the end of summer, We'll take a really good look at what's happening with respect to vaccination opportunities and may redirect some of those resources from drive-throughs to more pop-up or more targeted clinics to help stimulate more first doses and second doses. But at this point in time, there's no uh, plan to cut back on drive-throughs at any type of fixed date. Follow-up, Laura? Yes, thank you very much. Um, where are the areas of the province where vaccination rates are lower? Um, will the, I, I mean, where, will there be any information available on those zones, uh, for instance, listed on provincial websites, say, you know, southeast, south central, that sort of thing, um, northeast, northwest, as Dr. Shahab was mentioning earlier, there's some areas where vaccine uptake is quite a bit lower, and that's where we're seeing more cases. Scott and Dr. Shahab, any comment on that? 
So maybe I can make some initial comments. So like I said, there's actually um, a lot of alignment right now with where our cases are, even though our cases are low, they are being reported for the most part in the uh, far north and north of the province, uh, in the north central PA and area in the northwest and in the far north. Um, that's also now where we're increasingly seeing some of the uh, new variants of concern, the, um, the um, um, gamma and the delta variants. And, and I would also like to say further to the comments made by the Premier that when we look at our new hospitalizations, unfortunately, that is also where our current and new hospitalizations are uh, fo uh, focused on. And I must add that our hospitalizations Again, for the in the recent um, you know two to four weeks, infectious cases are predominantly in people who are younger than 50. So uh, you know our vaccination rates are not just lower geographically in the north and far north, and to some extent southwest and southeast of the province, uh, you know more rural areas. But uh, the the uh, the new cases are predominantly in the same populations who are under vaccinated, and also you know we are continue to see. Uh, hospitalizations, um, uh, you know, it takes a long time to, in some cases, to uh, become uh, recover, to be well enough to be discharged. So we see some uh, hospitalizations that are non-infectious, but we continue to see uh, new hospitalizations, um, especially in people who are younger than 50, uh, which we saw in Regina when we had the surge with the alpha variant. And now we continue to see with the alpha and delta variants and the and the and the gamma variants, you know, we continue to see hospitalizations predominantly in young people who are unvaccinated, both in ICU and acute care. Thank you. We'll take another question on the line. Operator. We have Allison Bamford with Global. Hi there. Um, with, uh, it's been about 10 days, I think, since we've been sitting just under 70% um, of that first dose threshold. Um, what makes you confident that enough people won't become complacent and will get their second dose, given life is essentially returning to normal in, on July 11th, and you were saying we could be up to 70% second dose by the end of July? Because Saskatchewan residents are already doing just that. Um, uh, not only, uh, as we said, the, the benchmarks that we had put in place, uh, and I explained the covered population versus the, uh, the statistics, statistics, statistics Canada actual population. Um, but what we have seen when we achieved the other benchmarks that we had put forward, 40 plus, is uh, Saskatchewan residents 40 and over did not quit coming out for their first dose and most certainly are coming out for their second dose. Uh, we've now achieved uh, uh, 80% of people over the age of 40 that have received their, their first dose. Uh, 30 plus is, is proving to be the same. Uh, we're 75% uh, in, in that age category that have now received their first dose. 18%, which we achieved uh, just uh, late last week. Uh, we're, we're already at 71% and continuing to increase our, uh, our percentages there, which uh, really uh, lends credence to uh, Dr. Shahab's words, words about um, once you are eligible, you are always eligible and we continue to encourage can encourage anyone that has not made the decision to go out and get their first dose, ultimately their second dose, uh, to do so and to do so sooner uh, rather than later. We're also seeing in, in large, large numbers across the province people coming out for that second dose. In fact, uh, Saskatchewan is, is leading the nation, the only uh, province to be above 40% of our eligible population that has uh, came out and, and received uh, their second dose. And so we uh, continue to have faith in, in the people of this province that they uh, will do the right thing. Uh, and, and go out and get vaccinated by the vast majority. They are proving to do uh, just that. Um, and as I said, that, that is how we ultimately will keep ourselves safe and those around us safe. But uh, for those that are, are you know, pondering uh, whether or not to get vaccinated, um, we are going to learn how to live with COVID. We are going to reopen our communities and our, our businesses and our, our society in general. Uh, we're not going to wait for you to make that decision, uh, but we would urge you to make it sooner rather than later because we do have vaccines that are available for you and we don't want you uh, to be choosing uh, to live with an unnecessary risk uh, that, you may, that you may be considering. Uh, Scott or Dr. Schaub, anything to add? Well, I think to your point, Premier, if we just look at the numbers and the rapid rise in second doses that we've been seeing across the province over the last few weeks, and just to remind folks that, you know, three weeks ago we were in schools focusing on schools, which was a lot of first doses, but we also had a dedicated first dose strategy 
So we did take away a little bit from that momentum on second doses, but we're seeing it come up quite a bit right now. The booked appointments are, are snapped up, no, no pun intended, very quickly uh, by individuals looking for second doses across this province. And we expect that that's gonna continue well into the rest of the summer as we reach that 70, 70 mark and hopefully 75, 75, and then 80, 80. Follow up, Allison. Um, yeah, the, the deaths that we uh, keep seeing, is there any indication that those are from the Delta variant or any other variant? Dr. Schaub? I think some of that information we have, uh, um, you know, committed to bring on a monthly basis. So, you know, we, uh, as part of our breakthrough uh, case rate, so we will bring that now and maybe in a week or two as an update on uh, both uh, cases, hospitalizations, and if we can get some information on, um, it, it may not always be available on hospitalizing death by variants, but certainly, you know, other jurisdictions, Canada and other countries have shown that uh, the reason that, you know, there can be many variants circulating and some, not all are considered of interest. Some are considered variants of interest. And then from those, you know, only a few are considered variants of concern, VOCs, and at the moment we have four um, in, 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 in North America and Saskatchewan has seen all four, but you know, it, 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 all four are called variants of concern exactly because they, they are either more transmissible, which all, all four can be, or they are uh, more severe, which you did see with alpha in younger uh, people and delta in younger people as well, and other parts of the world have, have been devastated by that. And thankfully, you know, all four, um, you know, the, vac the current vaccines provide excellent protection against all four. So again, this is, uh, you know, our best uh, defense against um, COVID, including all current variants of concern circulating in Saskatchewan, is the vaccine. We have time for an additional question in the room. Arthur? Yeah, I believe from Dr. Shahab, uh, there was a study that came out today out of the Royal Society of Canada, drawing on some previous findings, but kind of broadening it, uh, finding that uh, there were a large number of, you know, excess deaths uh, that can't be accounted for just through the COVID-19 numbers that we've already reported. Uh, and, 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 and here it was several times more. I believe they said about six times more. I'm just wondering whether you think that we've detected all of the COVID-19 deaths uh, in this province. Yeah, thanks, Arthur. I did see that study, and obviously we work very closely uh, with our colleagues in vital statistics and e-health, and also we work very closely with the chief coroner's office to do exactly that, that, you know, whenever there is... Uh, some concern about um, uh, cause of death not identified. We uh, obviously work with the coroner's office. Uh, you know, while many provinces and many countries have shown some excess mortality, and you know, some of that could be due to COVID, which was not identified, uh, and some could have been due to um, other issues that were indirectly impacted uh, uh, by COVID. You know, delay in seeking healthcare. At this point, to my knowledge, we haven't found a, a big gap in Saskatchewan, but this is something that we are continuing to look at. And, you know, as part of our monthly kind of review, we can certainly look at that more closely. But again, on, on a case-by-case -case basis, you know, uh, whenever there's a concern about, you know, uh, what was the cause of death, if it's not always uh, clearly evident, then, you know, uh, screening for COVID is a routine part of, um, you know, healthcare, in fact, uh, you know, there's been almost, on, almost, and Scott can confirm that, that for the last several months, there has been universal screening of all patients within healthcare facilities. So, you know, we don't think we may have missed, uh, uh, to a great extent, uh, such events. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, you know, sudden death in the home setting also, the coroners are aware under the leadership of the chief coroner uh, to screen for COVID if thought appropriate. But certainly that's something we'll continue to monitor. And I'll just see if Scott has any additional comments. Um, just to confirm that you're right on the acute care screening, Dr. Schwab. Did you have a follow-up, Arthur? I'm just wondering then what, why you think there is this wide uh, gap between the amount of excess deaths that we've seen relative to what would be expected 
uh, and, 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 and those that have actually taken place, what accounts for that if not COVID deaths that we haven't detected? speculate on you know national data or data from other provinces i think we do continue to look closely at data from saskatchewan and we can certainly you know we do drill down at, uh, to some extent on a on a monthly basis and we can certainly bring uh, some of our findings back as we do the monthly review on uh, on breakthrough cases and hospitalization and death so we can look at that from that perspective as well arthur but i would not like to speculate at this point on that that concludes today's update. Thank you for joining us.